So, did any of you know that Yael is Australian? Yes. <laughs> That's very sweet of you to know that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, I wanted to start at the beginning before we get into Orange. And I know that you went to performing arts school, right, when you were like 12? Yeah, yeah, I went to a performing arts high school. And was that a choice? Were you really interested in acting already? How I was forced to by my parents. No, that's not true. Whose parents forces them to go to a performing arts high school? It makes no sense. Um, my sister had gone there before me, and, um, and it was a beautiful, amazing school that took care of an academic learning, but also just really emphasised the ex extracurricular stuff. So the the experience was really well-rounded and I loved that school. So, did you know that you wanted to be an actor when you were 12? <laughs> um, um, no, it took a really, really long time for me to, to feel confident enough to say that I wanted to be an actor. Um, that didn't stop the fact that I was acting um, quite a lot of that time. <laughs> um, so I started when I was about eight and it was very much about speech and drama. It was very much about poetry and, uh, and doing readings and doing Estedfords and, and I really enjoyed that aspect. Um, I, I, f I think I found something in the language that made me feel larger and I felt so small and everyone was constantly telling me how little I was and I was kind of sickly as a child and I, I couldn't do sports, I couldn't breathe very well and, uh, and finding this language in, in, in poetry and these kind of really grand themes that I was interacting with made me feel so powerful. Um, so, so I knew I loved it. I didn't, I didn't really know that it could be a job. Um, so that, that took a long time. And what was your first professional audition? Was it for, because your first movie was when you were 14, right? Yes, I think I was 13. Oh, wow. Um, and that was my first audition. So I figured it was pretty easy to get a job. You went to the audition and they gave you the job. That's how it works, right? It's kind of just like that. Um, <laughs> so I went with a friend of mine um, who was like, let's do this thing. There was a sign up at school and um, yeah, it was very, it was really, I mean, it was incredibly lucky and I feel like that just happened again and again that I was really very lucky um, and I ended up doing this, this film. I was on a film set. I was 13. I didn't have an agent. I, I I negotiated the contract myself, I think. Uh, I literally just signed it. And I had, you know, spent the week practicing my signature. Um, but <laughs> I was suddenly playing Rachel Griffith's daughter and I was really being, things were being asked of me and I was being treated like an adult. And once again, it was one of those feelings of like, I've got to rise to the to the challenge here, and I really enjoyed that. I, I enjoyed I enjoyed that in a professional way and in an artistic way, um, and I and I I think there were little moments um, in that experience, even though I was so young, where I was like, "Wow, this is there's something special here." And were you getting good feedback about your acting abilities? Were you like, "Oh, maybe I have a talent." <laughs> I suppose the feedback is in, you know, is in the enjoyment of the job. I, I would really, my parents are wonderful and never really emphasised like, everyone thinks you're great. You know, that, for me, I think that would have been very strange. So it was just like business as usual. Like, oh, you're doing this thing, great. Whatever you do will support you. If you continue to enjoy this, great, keep doing it. Um, but it, it certainly wasn't a situation where, you know, we were reading reviews or... Uh, no, it, it was just the, a sense of enjoyment and a sense of fulfilment. And if there were opportunities at the local community hall or on a film set, it wasn't... It didn't feel so different. It was just like an opportunity to express myself and to, to work on this craft that I'd found. And when did you realise that actually it's not as easy to, as just showing up to the audition and you do have to negotiate contracts and all of that? I'm sorry, what? Um, <laughs> um, well, I, I guess things, everything changed after I went to, to drama school. 
um, I, I suppose there is a moment where, you, you know, you make a decision and you commit to study um, and that was another step in that direction. But I was still wondering, and I was 18. I was 21 when I graduated and I, I kind of think of myself, you know, I think back and I think, well, of course you didn't know what you were doing. <laughs> um, but it, it was another step in the direction of like, oh, this is, a, this is a fascinating world and there's so much to learn. And for me, it's always about the people that you get to meet. So you do this production and you, and you kind of have this incredible bond with people either on or off the stage. Um, f f you know, for me, I'm thinking in a theatre context because that's where all of my work was mainly. Um, and and I just, I felt this richness of community, of, of conversation. Um, when I was working on plays, the plays allowed the conversation to be larger than, than a kind of domestic level of thinking, I, I really enjoyed all of that. So it was the work itself, the people um, being asked to step up. I, I, I enjoyed those things very much. And um, when, was it quite a rarity at your university or your drama school for some people to have actually been in professional productions? Well, Kate Blanchett went there, so not, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> lots, of, lots of fancy people went there. So it was kind of scary. They were all on the walls. They still are um, in these amazing hallways. It's a, it's a, the, the drama school is called NIDA, and it's our, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of great teaching that happens in Australia. And, you know, NIDA is one of those schools that, that people want to get into. And, um, and it was a really strong experience for me and, and certainly the inheritance of all those people like Kate Blanchett and, you know, so many wonderful, wonderful Australian actors who are either elsewhere or at home in Australia doing incredible work. Um, it, it, it's very inspiring, but it's intimidating as well. And I know that you started out in theatre and you were talking about theatre. Was most of your training at school theatrical? Or did they teach you, like, how to act in front of the camera? I don't know how to act in front of the camera. Um, uh, yes, that was certainly something was it, that was addressed. Uh, you know, I'm still really confused about that definition. I, and I'd be very interested in, in your thoughts. I don't know. There's a, whole lot of, there's a whole lot of thinking about what's different about those modes. And for me, if I separate it too much between film and theatre... Um, there's a there's some terror in doing that because I sort of feel like I don't people should never be af actors shouldn't be afraid to make bold choices on screen. I mean we see it all the time and it's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing to do. Um, so so for me thinking oh I need to bring things in and make things smaller and contain it for a screen is uh, is kind of troubling for me. Um, so I don't like to think of them as two separate schools. So when I was being taught about acting in the theatre, I, I would like to think I was also being taught about acting on screen. And you have never been on either Home Away or Neighbours. I know. Thank you for <laughs> mentioning that. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, that, I, I, I say that in jest because, like, Whatever doorway you use to, um, to, to work is a wonderful doorway. Um, and, the, and both of those sets are wonderful breeding grounds for talent. And they allow people to have an opportunity to work. And that's what we want to do. We, we want to work. We want to practice. And, um, and I, I worked on a beautiful soap opera in Australia called All Saints. I did, it was my first job out of school. Um, it was six months and it was the most wonderful education because, you know, you come in as a guest character and your storylines are like up here. The stakes are always high for those guest characters because you're getting the most dramatic storylines. And that was, that was excellent for me. That was wonderful kind of emotional gymnastics that was being, being asked of me and, and it, was, it was great. So I, you know having not been on Neighbours or not been on Home and Away, I, I really, 
you know, I'm sure there's so much to learn. And those guys, they shoot so fast, that those, both of those shows. They, they shoot an incredible amount, uh, you know, in one day. And that's a, that's a real skill, to be able to just, like, turn it on. I, I, I think there's a lot to be learnt in all different areas. So I'm not saying no to Home and Away in Vegas. <laughs> okay, good. Um, and Lorna was also a guest character originally, right? Or only I think we all were from the stories. <laughs> no. um, yeah, she was. I mean, I, I, I assumed I had, uh, I think, three weeks, uh, three days on this show. I, that was how long I was engaged for that first episode. And, um, and it just kept going and I kept coming in and, and it was delightful. I, I know that Uzo had a similar experience. We were just like, mm, mm, mm. Um, and And I, I kind of didn't talk to any of the, the big wigs for a long time because I was like, I think they don't know I'm here. <laughs> if I don't say anything to anyone, they won't tell me to leave. <laughs> so. Did they officially sit you down when you became a series regular? <laughs> Um, no, I wasn't in their company when that happened. Uh, but but it's a delightful thing, you know. Being part of the show, it doesn't. It, it never felt like oh, there was a separation between th these people. And it's an incredibly warm, connected show. And I'm sure that that you can see in all those performances. There's so much ease between people. There's so much warmth, um, and and kind of p performative flow because. It's, it's such a nurturing environment. Um, so for me, there's not a, there's not a great shift. It, it was from day one, it was really supportive and really fun. And I think we all knew we were doing something risky. You know, we were kind of like, all right, we're in this together. Um, and there was, a, there was kind of a sense of like, oh, well, we're making this internet streaming show. We'll see how that goes. Um, and and it's about ladies and it's about things we haven't talked about publicly before and, you know, we didn't know how it was going to go. We knew we were loving it and then when it when it came out and, and people really took to it, <clears throat> pardon me, and took to the characters with such warmth, it was amazing. It's such a big cast. How do you find that feeling of we're all in this together when there's so many people? Just we wear the same clothes, so we feel real. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, no, there's a look. I'm going to be very serious about that. There are a lot of parties, and we work really hard to bond. Um, no, that's not. Tr we don't work hard. It's just very. It's very organic, and it's very. Um, the experience is very. Sh it, it's very warm, and you know. There are some of us who've been there from episode one, some people who've come on later in the show, some people who were there for five minutes um, and stayed for the rest of the time. I mean, everybody has been so welcoming and everybody has been welcomed. And I think that's a, a good deal of the success of the show because I think when you feel confident that everyone's got your back, you can make choices that are risky you can you can offer something that might not work but it also might work um, and you can feel safe to do that and I think whatever context we work in be it as actors or anything else that we do the best work we do is when people invest in us with trust and I I really feel like that's been the experience on the show I mean right down to the auditioning it wasn't rounds and rounds and rounds and, you know, chemistry tests. And it was like, come in, do your work. And, and it happened really quickly. It was like, here's the phone call. All right, you're on set next week. It was like, felt very unusual for me. What was the character breakdown you received when you auditioned for Lorna? Because she had a different name, right? No, I think she had her name. Yeah, no, she had her name. Okay. Um, the character breakdown was Lorna is wearing makeup. <laughs> yeah. That was it. Oh, really? Yeah. So, did you come up with this whole Natalie Woods aesthetic by yourself? Um, I felt like there was something, there was obviously something 
about her on the page. I think her syntax is kind of there anyway from the first episode. It was there. Um, the audition scene was the scene where Lorna is in the van. She picks Piper up. She talks about her wedding dress. There was so much flair in there already. So I was, you know, I was looking at the, the limited amount of information that, that you have on the page, but it's rich information because they're good writers. And so you kind of play from, from that point. Um, and then in terms of the lipstick, I, I had got, gotten married the day before. So I had one lipstick. It was red. I put it on. Yeah, uh, but no, she. Uh, that is true. But I, I kind of when I when I came in on my first day, there was a great conversation with uh, our wonderful hair and makeup team, and we kind of dreamed up very collaboratively this idea that oh, maybe she's kind of old school. Like maybe she's got some. Maybe she's a little stuck in the past, and that's a that's such a beautiful key for the character. I think you know that she's a little. She can't quite let go and and what she's hanging on to is an illusion what she's hanging on to is west side story some she's she's clinging to west side story like it's a childhood memory like it's in her soul and so what's going on there and that's like what a wonderful place to start from and those collaborations particularly with with hair and makeup can be so valuable when you just like open up to this incredible creative skills that, that those people have, that, that creative conversation just can keep happening and happening. Some people have said that Lorna's sort of stuck in adolescence. Do you feel like that's fair? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, I often feel that she's younger than me. I feel like, I said, I feel quite protective of her um, because I think she hasn't had opportunities to, to grow. Um, is that fair? I don't know. I, I don't want to, I don't want to judge her too harshly, but I think I definitely felt like when we finished season two, um, I'm sorry if you haven't seen season two, but I'm going to say something. Um, <laughs> when Nikki found out the truth about Christopher and, and Lorna was faced to, faced with sharing that truth, I think I think, you know, when, when we have to deal with that stuff, something cracks open and it makes us vulnerable and we heal and we change. And I think those experiences have been few and far between for her because she hasn't had a lot of loving influence that's just accepted her how she is. Um, so I think the more and more that can happen to a character or to a person, um, the, the greater chance they have to develop and heal. So I think that's... That's sort of my way of answering it. Like, perhaps she is in an adolescent phase because she just hasn't been given enough, enough reinforcement, enough love, and enough kind of chance, opportunities to heal and change and learn. Um, yeah, but I think that's an interesting point. And with Christopher, her fiancé, you know, you hear about her fiancé from the very beginning... At what point did you realise or were you told that actually it's not quite what she describes it as? When I read the episode oh, in my really? inbox, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I mean, I had a sense that something wasn't quite right. <laughs> yeah. There was a strong sense of that. He, he never, ever showed up. Um, and... And that, you know, when somebody's clinging to something so hard, you got to ask yourself why. Uh, so I, th I think that was something I was sensing might be there. The extent that she went to, I was completely <laughs> surprised by um, and excited by. Uh, I thought it was pretty wild. And, and the episode is so beautifully constructed because you're, you're going back and learning new things, but you're also in the present 
learning new things about Lorna. She's she's doing some pretty new things in the present. And I think Sean Hedder, who wrote this particular episode, did such a marvellous job. Um, and the way that the stories weave in, you know, outside of, of whatever Lorna's doing, feeds so beautifully into everything. And I, I really enjoy that sense of looking back and also kind of look at what she's doing now. Um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Just when you realised that... Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was a total shock. It was a total shock. But it was wonderful. I loved it. I, 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 I think the extremity of it is it doesn't feel too far. It, it sits well. So coming from a theatre background where you know the arc of your character in advance... What's it like to have surprises like that and then have to think, oh, well, does this affect the backstory I had? Like, what's that like to deal with? It was very hard in the beginning. I, I wanted to hold everything. I wanted to, like, know everything. And, and I do a lot of writing as the character. I'll kind of start off writing as myself about the character and then um, over time kind of turn it into a first-person sort of journaling. Um, I'll write letters as the character to people in the character's life. I kind of, or I'll, I do illustrations from their point of view. Like, uh, you know, so I like, I'm quite attached to biography and um, to where somebody's come from. And I had to really let that go. I wrote a whole story about Lorna and it was not the story that you just saw. I'll tell you that much. Like, I, I, I really, I've learnt a lot about flexibility, I think, from, from being on this show, that, it, you know, if you, if you commit to the moment 100%, if you commit to the, the choices, then that's all I can really do because I don't know. I don't know where we're going. I do know that I trust Genji and the writers 100%. They've never let us down. And for that reason, I just have a growing confidence of trying to be more flexible with with what I do um, on the show. And it, it works to, you know, greater and lesser extent sometimes. Like, sometimes I, I, don't, I don't feel like I've, you know, I don't feel like I've done a great job. And other times I feel like, well, I, I served that moment. And once you have the hair and the makeup and the clothes... And the accent, are you just automatically Lorna or does it take some journaling and things like that? On set? Not on set, but, you know, the night before maybe or when you're returning, for example, between yeah. season breaks. That's interesting. Yeah, I because it has been some time and she is very different to me. I was in Australia for, um, for longer than I've ever been back to Australia for and I suddenly in the middle of the night thought, I'll never be able to do it again. <laughs> I've been in Australia for too long. Um, but I do... I will look, I will look at the, the next season coming out before we start shooting again. I will want to kind of take a temperature read on where Lorna is at. Um, I guess there's a certain level of comfort because we've done it a few times. Um, but I, sh I would... I shouldn't like to fall into kind of trusting that too much. So, yeah, there's re revisiting the character, not, not the character from season one or season two, but where she is now. So trying to, trying to understand what's changed, what's new, what does she want now? And did you originally audition for Nikki? Is that true? Yes, I was very bad at doing Nikki. <laughs> very bad. I didn't have any of the chutzpah that was required. That was very clear to me. <laughs> I think that Natasha auditioned for Lorna as well, which is also quite funny. <laughs> That's hilarious. Did you ever switch roles as sort of an acting exercise when you started out? I mean, I guess you could interpret the sex scenes as a kind of... Uh, I'm not going to go there. Um, no, we have never switched roles. Um, so, what made you decide to move to the US? Hmm. Um, I have a very, very strong connection with the uh, Australian theatre scene in that I love it and that I think it's incredible and wonderful and produces such incredible shows and, and in terms of being part of those shows, 
I had the best experiences I could ever have had in terms of learning and growing. Um, and I was comfortable and I was felt uncomfortable about feeling comfortable. And I've always enjoyed, <clears throat> I've always enjoyed being uh, the underdog um, and a challenge. And I felt like, hmm, I suddenly got a little comfortable. I think I need to scare myself. And I had come over to New York to do Diary of a Madman with Jeffrey Rush at BAM. And yeah, what a guy. Um, he actually just made a speech today about how more women should be directing films. And I was proud to see that he'd done that. Um, so we came over and we did this, this show and it was such a wonderful show to be a part of. It was directed by a, a, a man that I so admire, Neil Armfield, and it was, a, it was kind of this wonderful graduation for me. I also had to shave my head to do it, um, which was also this very freeing thing. And here I was in New York working in the middle of winter and so it was kind of like this real shock for me <laughs> coming from Australia. And I thought, this seems scary. I should do this. <laughs> yeah, that was really the thinking. And did, did you ever have a moment while you were sort of waiting around to get your jo first job in New York of like, oh, I could be back in Australia doing plays. Why did I do this to myself? No. Um, one of the questions from the audience actually was sort of about Diary of a Mamma. And what project do you think is more dysfunctional for you? Orange is the New Black or Diary of a Madman? What project is more dysfunctional? <laughs> yes. Wow. That is the person who asked that here? Just out of interest? No. They just smoke bomb and then leave with their question. <laughs> I can't even check the, the... There we go. It was you. That's such an interesting question. Do you mean like the experience of doing the job? Um, as though perhaps it would make me feel dysfunctional because both, both plays are kind of, Both experiences sort of in madness, is that... Yeah, okay. Um, thank you for clarifying. Uh, such different kinds of madness. Um, in that show, I played all of... Jeffrey's visions, in a way, all of his visions of of femaleness, um, all the different ways he saw women in his life as he was sort of spiralling towards this madness. And so um, that was very different. I was kind of presenting something. I was almost... There was a feeling of, like, attacking him um, because he was on this downward spiral. Um, so... So there wasn't a great sense of dysfunction in that for me because I felt like I was part of his hallucination. Um, playing Lorna, I do... F I feel her pain a lot, um, but she's a character and I'm not her and I am, have to be very, you know, very clear about that with myself. Um, but there's certainly elements that are, that are very painful, perhaps particularly in this episode, um, that doing it... I, I touched on that dysfunction, um, but there's so much fun in both of those examples. There's so much joy and um, just c complete fulfilment in both of those jobs. So I would say it's the opposite of dysfunction. I don't find exploring difficult things, um, I don't want it to be like a cancer. Otherwise that will stop me doing my the job that I love so much. So I actually, both of those experiences are just so good. Do you think that you have to, on some level, like a character in order to play them? I have always um, stayed away from tr judging people too much. Um, not that you, that you can't, it's just how I have, I guess it's how I've been taught, um, but it's something that's worked for me to kind of not judge too much to kind of gently guide the judgment over to empathy like why why would somebody do something like this and I I guess 
on a larger scale, I try and live like that a little bit more, you know? Yeah. Have you ever had a moment where it's been sort of really difficult to find that empathy? No, I've obviously fooled myself quite well because no, I, I, I don't. Um, I, enjoy, I enjoy making links and understanding what makes somebody do something um, and be a certain way. So I haven't really judged characters that I've played harshly. So I have another question from the audience, which is when deciding whether you are interested in playing a role, what do you look for in a script? I look for, I look for narrative. Um, and, th and that doesn't mean something has to follow a beginning, middle and end, but I look for the, the energy of the storytelling um, and if it's, if it's something that can wrap me up and, and, and take me away. It doesn't have to have answers. It doesn't have to solve a problem. But I think if there's a rigorous narrative energy, I find that very exciting. You also have a theatre company right here in New York that you run? Yeah, well, it's changed, it's changed forms. Um, we had a space in Bushwick where we would do kind of, I guess, a, a salon-style situation. So the idea was how can, we, how can we create a space where people can bring their new work and share it without judgement? Um, so we had lots of people come and share unfinished things, things that they'd been, you know, in their bedrooms writing away and hadn't been able to share. And I think so many creative people do that, seeing lots of nodding. <laughs> and w we just wanted to explore what that would be like um, if we gave those projects some air uh, in, in the midst of a creative process. So without judgment, what is it to, to share your work? Is it good for the work? Is it bad for the work? We didn't know the answer. And, you know, it was, it was a wonderful experiment. I think that, that style, um, I think we're kind of, that, that was a wonderful experience. And some of those, the, the people that read their work, then we worked more privately with them and continued on the journey with their, their, their dreams and c tried to like listen and uh, but I think we might change the format um, and perhaps look at doing something that's more complete just to, to feel what that is um, but yeah it was a wonderful experience we no longer have the studio in in Bushwick so that's just changed the nature of it but it was it was amazing I wish I'd taken more videos now that I think about it Ooh. Um, and obviously you've worked with a lot of really interesting people like Jeffrey Rush and all of the women on Orange is the New Black. Is there sort of anyone who's given you a piece of advice that really stuck with you as an actor? I should think of an answer to this question, some wonderful thing that I can say. But I don't... It's For me, it hasn't been like that. Um, it's been the little things every step of the way. And it's, you know, Jeffrey is wonderful and I learned a great deal from him. I also learned a great deal from people whose names would mean absolutely nothing to you. Um, I think that the people, there are many, many actors in an industry and uh, we don't know a lot of their names and it's the, the lessons that we get from everyone that we work with that has kind of enriched my experience. And, you know, it's, it's often in the moment of the acting that I'll learn something rather than the conversation afterwards. We talked about this a little bit, but um, binge watching, obviously that's like a hot topic right now and Orange is the New Black is part of that. Are there any shows that you consume in that way? There are shows that I'm really, uh, I'm really into. Yeah. <laughs> I try not to watch more than two at a time because my brain goes mushy and I lose the narrative that I like so much um, because I cannot remember anything. So, um, yes, I have, I hope you don't hate me for this, but I had not watched The Sopranos and... I watch, I'm almost at the end, don't tell me what happens. <laughs> um, and that has been my, the last few months and I'm so into it. 
Um, I think it's just amazing. Actually, the man that directed that episode, Phil Abrams, he shot most of The Sopranos. And the, the second time around that we worked together, I'd started watching The Sopranos. And I'd gone from, you know, having a nice, good working relationship with Phil to being like, I'm kind of nervous around Phil. <laughs> he shot The Sopranos. <laughs> Um, but I, I love that show and I have been caught up in the Game of Thrones stuff. Um, I'm, I've got strong feelings about dragons, you know, I'm, I'm right there. I probably should have mentioned that's another question from people in the audience. Oh, also, sorry, in the midst of the Game of Thronesing and the Sopranosing, I have just completed House of Cards and I'm very excited about what's gonna happen next. And I've talked a lot about it with certain people in my life. And I also listen to the On The Media podcast about House of Cards. Um, so I feel like a real nerd. Do people expect you to know things about other Netflix shows? Are they like? Um, I don't think so, because there's so many of them now. It would be hard to watch them all. Um, I've been, I feel really excited to have been part of the show from that early kind of new content phase and it's wonderful to see what they're doing. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty exciting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming and for talking to everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really, really appreciate you all coming. It's very sweet. I was so nervous. I thought, we're going to be sitting alone in a room. And then you guys came. Thank you very much.